So we have about 40 minutes. And uh, you know, the, the way we like to organize these events and, and uh, think about the structure of the panel, uh, panel we, we, we're trying to have representation from a lot of different areas of the ecosystem. So we have uh, academic perspective. We have a corporate perspective. We have a startup perspective. And then uh, we try to have an investor perspective as well. And so that's a little bit what we have here today. So, uh, so Jan Schnorr, he's the CEO. He's one of the new faces here. You haven't seen him earlier this morning. So he's the CEO of the company you heard earlier this morning, C2Sense, uh, which is a, also a Stex25 company, part of our accelerator program. Uh, we heard from Al uh, Tejal Modi, MD at Rabobank, which has an uh, amazingly long history in agriculture and agri-finance. Um, and then you know, Caleb and Dilip. Um, we're going to leave some time for Q&A at the end. So uh, maybe we'll leave five, to, uh, five, 10 minutes, but we're going to try to go in no more than 40 minutes. Um, so maybe, what, uh, since we haven't heard from, from Rabobank earlier, maybe uh, I'm going to ask Tejal to just give a quick overview of, uh, of their work in uh, agri-finance. Sure. So my name is Tejal Modi. I run business development and strategy for Rabobank in North America. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of Rabobank, we are a Netherlands-based bank, a very large global bank actually, operating in 40 countries with a balance sheet of close to $700 billion. We are the largest and, and probably the most prominent food and ag-focused bank in the world. Uh, the bank is a cooperative, and it was actually founded by Dutch farmers in the late 1800s. Um, it still is a cooperative, so we're not publicly traded. And one of the unique aspects of that, I think, is that the bank has a very long-term focus and ongoing commitment to food and agriculture, all the way from production uh, down to sort of retailers and, and the entire, basically the entire food supply uh, chain and, and the entire food system. Um, the bank is also very focused on sustainability in the food system based on our roots and based on many of the social uh, missions of the bank. And so we see innovation really as sort of at the core uh, of the future of this sector. And um, it's, it's an area in which the bank uh, you know, invests a fair amount of resources and is very committed to. So. Great, great. Thank you for that. Um, there are two key topics that I think we're going to try to cover here. Uh, so many interesting uh, presentations and uh, discussions early this morning. Um, but you know, at a high level, I'm going to try to cover collaboration between big companies and startups. Uh, and that's really one of the key goals of, of these events that we, uh, that we organize, uh, which is why we bring uh, you know, a number of startups on stage and we try to fill a room with <coughs> people from the corporate side. So that's one topic. And then we're going to talk broadly about innovation and, and technology and try to split it about half and half on, on those two topics. So let's start with collaboration. And, uh, and, and let's start with a startup. Uh, Jan, you know, assuming there's fit between you and the corporate partner, what are some challenges that you see arising, and, and how do you, as a startup, try to uh, try to mitigate those? Um, yeah. yeah, thanks, thanks, Marcus. Yeah, very nice to be here. Um, it's uh, so we've done collaborations in the past, uh, very very successfully for both sides. What um, really helps is to make sure the fit is there. So sometimes you. There is general overlap of the areas, but it's not quite the the product's not quite the most beneficial for both. I think a big challenge is sometimes just the timeline between a startup um, between between a startup and a large corporation. For a startup, negotiating a JDA for six or twelve or eighteen months can be quite challenging. Um, because you have to think of a funding cycle for a large corporation that at least six months is, is not uncommon at all. So timing is, is a big question. And then the other question is, let's say you get to a product together. How can you make it more likely that this product actually gets introduced, where both parties benefit at the end uh, through licensing or, or through, through some other arrangement? So seeing it through pretty far to the end and making sure the process is quick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dilip, any comments, you know, given your work with startups, any comments on what, a, you know, a big company can do or even like a startup can do to uh, overcome some of those challenges, you know, in terms of a timeline, in terms of different internal processes? W what are you doing at Mahindra to? 
Well, to your I think well, uh, so. So, well, let, let me just address one of the challenges that we have. It's always about what the customer wants, and it is about price point, and uh, it, it it is about uh, a, a very competitive marketplace. So, and they want simplicity. So, uh, particularly a farmer does not want anything that is complex, uh, and then. And then the issue is how competitive can we bring the product to the market. So when we work with startups, <coughs> I think the issue that we have is how can we be competitive? So all, and, and how can we make it as simple as possible for the farmer? So that is really what we are working on. Uh, whenever we work with, the, with any of the startups or we do it internally too, whether it's uh, or with, when we work with universities, uh, the question is, Simplicity and cost effectiveness. Mm -hmm. um, Caleb, a any uh, specific uh, advice you would have? I mean, you, so you 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 have, you're a founder of two startups. You have corporate uh, funders of your of your research. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, any specific advice you would give either party in terms of what they should be thinking about internally to uh, to you know to try to uh, overcome some of these challenges. Yeah, um, it's like being on both sides in Star Wars. Uh, you know, um, on the lab side or on the academic side, um, it's worked best with the companies that, that I work with that benefit, let's say, in some bigger way than just the science that's coming out of my lab, if that makes sense. So it's not that the companies that support my work, like Target and Wellspun and, and Ferrero, um, think that the IP that I'm working on right now will go into their company, be proprietized, and be something valuable in the next three years. That is not why they work <laughs> with us. Uh, it is that they have a major problem that is probably related to their supply chain uh, that they see coming down the pipeline, and they'd like to get ahead of it. Um, hazelnuts, uh, we all know the problem in Turkey going on right now. Turkey produces 70% of the world's hazelnuts. Ferrero buys 50%. Hazelnut is declining in both quality and planted acres. So that's the kind of big problem that they come at me with in the lab. And I say, okay, that, that's super interesting. Let's figure out how we would try to address that issue. Startup side, no such luxury. Uh, and I would say it's really hard. Um, we don't have any clients on the startup side right now because flagship's model is more bring it internal, build out the technology and the team, and then scale uh, at later rounds. Um, and so for us, it's been, um, yeah, you know, <laughs> immediately what commercial need are we fulfilling, uh, which is what I guess any startup is trying to do. Um, but I think working with the venture capitalists on that, uh, important for them to remember, most of my time is in the lab. Uh, and so my commitment to the startup can be strategic, uh, non-operational, uh, unless I leave. And that's a big struggle when they find a founder that is still in an academic position. And I think that's one of the, the things that I run into the most on the VC side. Um, yeah. Right, and um, yeah, we've seen uh, many of our successful startups where as a requirement of funding, they, the, the, the funder, I mean the founder, if he's a faculty, ends, ends up leaving and taking a little bit of a leave and absence and then, then coming back. Um, so f working with farms and, and enabling that simplicity is important and uh, it's also a very dirty environment, uh, you know, in, in, imperfect, maybe uh, dusty, and, and, and so forth. Um, Tejal, and you have a strong relationship with those farms. You understand how they think and, and um, what kind of things they would respond well to. What, what advice would you give to startups to improve their chances of collaborating with farms? I mean, I agree with what's been said so far, and I think that um, you know we we work with uh, farmers, small scale, you know, to medium scale farmers all around the world. And one of the things we think that is really important, hopefully, we can we can bring to this ecosystem is connecting technologies with our network of of farms and farmers. Um, and I, I completely agree. You know, even even actually, many of the bankers at Rabobank are farmers. They they come from a farming background, and I think that it's that sort of understanding and intimacy with, with this end client that we serve in a different capacity, which allows us to, um, and, and it's tough, you know, to kind of think about where are the hassles actually being brought in? Where are these frictions that are actually being introduced in the beginning um, to kind of, and what do we need to get over? 
Um, and where is already that, a lot of that inherent insight so that we can actually work with the farmers to kind of combine um, various approaches with some of these technologies as opposed to sort of coming in and kind of, off, you know, yeah. presuming to kind of have a, have a solution that solves everything. Right. So I think a lot of it is dialogue and getting to know the farmers, and it, it's something we spend a fair amount of time on. Do you, do you find that you're taking more of a role um, making those introductions and putting the two parties together? You're, you're a trusted entity on the, by the farmer's side. Is that something you're doing more of? Is that a good path in general, would you say? Startups? I think if it brings value to the farmers, you know, because at the end of the day, these are all stakeholders that we serve. They're our constituencies, and I think we're very focused on what are the economic realities, you know, where is the value, and if we really believe there is a solution that could be quite interesting, then it's sort of aligned then with the way we serve this stakeholder group. So yeah, you know, I think it's something we're trying to figure out how to do more of, especially as we play a much bigger role in the innovation ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah, if I could, yeah. if I could just so, make a comment, please. Yeah. dialogue is one of the, the most important things. And uh, some of the people who, who know me recognize I like to tell anecdotes or stories. But back in the mid '90s, there was a, you know the first one of the first uh, genetically engineered products that was out on the market was BT corn. The T BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. It's basically a bacteria that allowed for uh, insect control through the production of an insecticidal toxin in corn plants. But I was going out, I was with a seed company back then called DeKalb, and uh, go out to talk to these guys, and they thought BT was biotech. They thought that's what the BT stood for. Well, they knew that it was gonna help them to solve a problem, but they related to biotech, and it was a, a biotech product. So that's a very simple thing, but it's still, it's getting the dialogue out about what the needs are and how we can help to meet those needs. And dialogue is, is, is critical. Because then the, also the, the thinking comes in, well, people recognize just from social media the increase in we've been able to do with respect to genomic sciences, but that's not gonna, just because we can sequence a genome doesn't mean we can use that information to provide a solution for the next growing season. So all that has to come in, and it's all discussion that has to go back and forth, not only with the grower, but I think also with the startup, or anybody that, we, that I interact with is how we can go out there and manage expectations, understand and manage expectations. Yeah, and, and so maybe following on that theme of, of dialogue, one of the words that I hear mentioned a lot, either on these types of panels or in discussions with, with our corporate members and startups is, um, you know, co-creation, joint development. Um, and it seems like the, the, the successful the, the big companies that are able to innovate successfully and work with startups have the ability to uh, overcome smaller hurdles in order to to produce something you know great together. Thoughts, comments, um, anyone who wanted to sort of take that a little bit further? Uh, uh, I was just thinking because we, we actually operate an accelerator called Terra, and that's the whole premise is basically to have corporates from across the supply chain actually come and be matched with, with young companies, with startups or scale-ups, so that they can actually pilot a sort of a product together. Um, and you mentioned <coughs> small hurdles, and actually sometimes these feel like pretty big hurdles, and it can be anything from sort of a procurement process to get the pilot sort of started, to kind of really identifying the right individuals within the organization to sort of run with it. So. We've learned that actually, um, and, and, and as a very large company ourselves, we find the same. You know, when we're when we're thinking about a fintech sort of scenario, right, for banking, um, it's really important to identify what those hurdles might be because it can waste actually a lot of precious time. And it's some of the feedback we get from the startups in the program that, wow, you know, like this is quite a Byzantine. Uh, it's quite difficult to actually get going. So it's it's something we've we've learned a fair amount about. Yeah. Um, I think the the corporations that I work with, you know, we start from day one on co-creation. Like they see the suite of technologies, they're like, have you ever grown cotton? And I was like, no, why would I ever grow cotton? And then they come in with a giant reason why I should grow cotton. And then we start planning trials, we start planning the phases of the projects, and we're literally meeting every two weeks with the team that they're building on the internal side, the team that I'm building. A pivotal point in all of my projects is the first deployment into that company. And then having a team ready to receive a deployment of technology that's been working with it already, that's trained and can take it forward. Because they always want, you know, I'm proof of concept stuff, and then they're scale it up stuff. And if, if they don't have a team that can fully understand all the things that we've been doing together, it falls dead. The contract ends on the research, um, which thankfully doesn't happen that much. But it's because it's, it's from day one, 
us solving problems together. So can you talk a little bit more about that, you know, when the contract falls dead, you know, yep. R&D, like what, what is going wrong there? Uh, mostly, well, stock price falls is one. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's happened. Um, you know, from the, the MIT side, and because we're usually looking longer, uh, if stock price or things like that fall, then, they're, then they tend to focus on the shorter term. So that's one thing, but of course that's, that's natural. The other one is that I'm running in a ghost ship in my research environment, and I never hear from them, and I don't know that I'm off course in terms of what applies uh, to what they're interested in, because I'm just a curious person. So like, if you leave me in a, a ship by myself, I will sail straight to the Bermuda Triangle, uh, because that's the most n interesting place to be. Um, so if we don't have communication often, and if that's not enabled by a framework, uh, obviously a legal framework, a financial framework, um, then it's, it's, uh, it's not a good situation. Got it, got it. And maybe to, to add what, what Kate said, for, for a startup that maybe looks at slightly shorter horizons, it's really the same question, right? What we are trying to do as early as possible is go to a customer, deploy our units, talk directly with a chicken grower or with a company in, in storage of fruit to see with our own eyes what the limitations are right there and further improve the product for the people who are actually going to use it. If, if you don't do that, the end of the project is inevitably leading to this vacuum where, where no product gets deployed. And it's, again, goes back to manage expectations. Because you have to make sure that what you set out to do in that contract is something that is both, uh, both place, it's a place where both, com both entities want to go. Right, right. And if all of a sudden, you know, and you don't get there for whatever reason and you argue within that team, then that's problematic. Yeah. And you want to be able to construct and develop and address those problems so you can steer properly. But uh, the challenge is, is that when you, when you have unrealistic expectations as well, at least with a company uh, as large as Bayer, that's one of the things that we, uh, that, that we come across often. Yeah. Actually, can you talk a little bit more about uh, LifeHub? You know, why, why that was started, what problem you were trying to solve with that, and, and what lessons learned? So one of the biggest things that we did when we put the, the, the LifeHub concept together was to develop kind of an outpost or an embassy where Bayer did not have a large physical presence. So for those of you around Cambridge here, you're not going to see a, a multi-story building with, with, with Bayer, the Bayer logo on it. Uh, we have some interactions here, and the idea here is to tap into this really rich tech ecosystem that it spans everything, all the, all the aspects that we've been talking about from, uh, from uh, biotech to, uh, to, to digital uh, out through uh, business modeling, all those types of things that we can do that we can access through here. So we put the hub together where we have, again, all three of our divisions co-located there, a small group, 12 people, uh, I'm the only crop science guy here in this, uh, at this site. But the, the idea is to go out and be the face of Bayer to the external community, to be able to bring things in, to make connections, look at collisions. I mean, I've, I've had conversations at bars where I've talked to somebody and not knowing who they are, and then we exchange cards, and then all of a sudden we're talking about something that we might be able to do later. So that's, what we're, that's one of the main reasons that, uh, that we are here, is to make these contacts, get these collisions going, have these targeted activities that where we want to where we want to work with we have a we have a good relationship with uh, with flagship for example uh, we have we already have that existing but what are the other things what are the next things that we could do and again not only in crop but also in pharma and in consumer health which is the the the, the, the those are the three areas where we're looking for those opportunities that's right, so being part of the just being part of the ecosystem is, is tremendously valuable and that's a theme that I hear myself many times from, from many different people. Right. That's the value of being. And, it's, and it, it's very important because most people, when you talk Bayer, they think aspirin. I mean, that's what most people think of. If, uh, if I could have talked to some of you guys a, a week ago, you might not have known that Bayer had a crop science business. Or even that Bayer is basically sells Dr. Scholz. You might not know that type of thing. But that's the thing. That that's what we're out here to do, to just to kind of be the, the, the face of Bayer out here and to educate people about what it is that, uh, that we do in our company. Good. Okay, so let's maybe switch gears a little, a little bit and go talk about innovation and technology. Uh, so a number of you mentioned biodigital convergence, aerodigital. 
uh, farming, um, digitization is happening across all industries. Where is agriculture today, would you say, in terms of development? Yeah, I think, I think agriculture is interesting in, as a space for, for a lot of innovation because we have, it's maybe a more traditional field than fintech, for, for example. At the same time, the, the growers are used to using Facebook or other apps on their smartphones, so they do have certain expectations. We, it's maybe a little more cost conscious than, than other fields. Um, and that combination leads to real demand for new solutions that haven't been found yet. So I think it's, it's a very interesting area, but it's also an area where you need to combine expertise from the Boston area with uh, more traditional food ag uh, hubs. And so you need to uh, get more moving parts together. And I think that's where, why we'll see a lot of innovation in that space that has happened maybe in other areas before. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something interesting here about combining expertise, and I'm thinking about Caleb's team. Uh, he, describes it, he describes it as anti-disciplinary. Um, you know, why is you know, Boston, why is Cambridge, why is the media lab well suited to solve problems in agriculture? Well, I hope it is. Uh, because of the simple thing that I'll go down to UC Davis, I'll go down to Texas A&M, I'll go up to Cornell, and I'll talk with brilliant plant scientists. And they have amazing ideas that are incredibly narrow in their field. And they're right. They're absolutely right about that idea. Then they're like, I really need this piece of technology uh, to be built to suit me, and I don't have it. Or if I had this technology that could produce a lot of data, that could be highly controlled, I could run experiments that would change the world. And so there, there is a nervousness every time I go. Uh, I've luckily been able to make friends, quick friends, at land grants. Uh, but there's a nervousness every time I go that uh, I'm here to steal your thunder um, because I'm carrying MIT <coughs> as a banner and I'm carrying technology as a banner and so therefore I'm going to get all the press and I'm going to get all the funding. I literally have people that like won't meet with me because they, they think that that's a threat. Hmm. And I'm trying to communicate that no, the things I'm working on are useless without the expert that can inform uh, the application of the tool. And so like that that is why I think in our group, I had to bring in a group of plant scientists, and not just plant scientists, but phytochemists, physiologists, and collaborate more, because then I learn what they need. And then I have to have engineers there that are creative and responsive, so that they can design and prototype a tool, we can go through a test, and we can do it again. And of course, the sponsor is usually our North Star. Are we going towards a direction that anybody cares about, so that we can continue doing the research, continue building new tools? And so that ecosystem is, is very much here, um, yeah. I, I interpreted your question a little bit differently when you first asked it. Yep. So I think because we take a, a, a pretty holistic view of the entire supply chain, you know, one of the things that we talk a lot about with our clients and with, with large producers as well is sort of the, the whole fork to farm phenomenon in terms of when we think about data and sort of the, when we, when we talked about yield management and resource management, but even in terms of transparency and sort of what what are consumers and sort of downstream participants in the supply chain increasingly sort of either expecting or pressure to sort of deliver? And how does that translate to sort of data and technologies further upstream and what might be required on the farm? And, and that's something that we see with some of the very large production companies, you know, kind of doing a fair amount, of course, you know, in terms of really trying to get that right. And in certain niches in sort of sustainable seafood or in other sort of different areas of food and agriculture, um, you know, kind of a bit of a leapfrogging in terms of value propositions that are oriented around data and transparency at that very upstream sort of part of the supply chain that make its way to the consumer in a more direct fashion, like essentially new business models. So I think that that's something we kind of think about a lot and are interested to sort of see is how those downstream pressures are perhaps, you know, creating opportunities, but also creating challenges, you know, as we go upstream. Now, one other thing though, Marcus, is that the grower, there's a huge amount of information that a grower takes now. Somebody's out there growing, a, a, a growing corn. There's a huge amount of information that comes in. He doesn't need to know about leaf angle or why a certain density or why he wants to plant this and that part. But he wants to know, what am I supposed to be doing? Where's my prescription? And what can I plug into my self-driving tractor eventually and have that go and have that uh, provide me with the, the best return on the investment that I've made in those tools? Mm -hmm. That's what the grower is, is really interested in. And of course, interested in the technology, but 
uh, you can't expect those guys to be out there trying to figure out like Caleb does. Well, what am I going to pull all this stuff together and, and make these correlations? We need somebody else to make those correlations for them. That's one of the things that we really need. And then they have to trust that they have their best interest. Uh, absolutely. Or they won't, you know, or they immediately get allergic. Yeah. It's like, uh, what are you going to do with my data? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to take advantage of me yeah. because I've been taking advantage of a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so that that transparency and truth is such a big part. And on the retail companies I work with, that's number one. The consumer asks for, where did my food come from? How good is it for me? And, and how good is it for the environment? Three simple questions that they've never asked mm -hmm. uh, in such large voices with their dollars. And so now you have all the big five pivoting, so launching venture capital funds because their own internal R&D are having you know, trust issues uh, with when they produce something. Is it going to be trusted? Will it be adopted? Is it coming from a trope company that people have, have harped on or not? And do I need to take my R&D budget, put it into venture capital, buy trust in a startup, and then eventually bring it back into my orbit, my ecosystem? Is, is trust different in agriculture? You know, we, obviously in autonomous vehicles, there's a big conversation around uh, safety and, and, and trust in the system. And you know, on one hand, it looks like technology is a better solution, but then the perception is, is maybe different. Is food in any way different from other industries, and why is it different? Well, I'll, I'll say I think it's different because, so if we go to the, we'll take an extreme example, boil it down to genetically engineered foods. I don't want in gen genetically engineered ingredients in my, in my foods. There's never been any issues related to safety, never been any issues related to any harm coming. But if you listen now, I'll talk about one of our own products, Xarelto. You listen to an ad about Xarelto on TV and all these potential counterindications that might come in. It might make you go bald, it might make you, you know, gain weight, et cetera, et cetera. But that doesn't, but people still are going to take Xarelto because they trust the benefit that they're going to be getting out of it. So with genetically engineered foods, for example, there's been a lot of concern. We don't know if it's safe. We don't know enough if it's safe or not. We can't put any disclaimers out there like we can for Xarelto because we haven't seen anything like that. You see what I mean? So those are some of the, that's one of the biggest challenges. And it comes down to the fact where, uh, where with, with the with one metric that Caleb used, people don't want DNA in their food. They don't want chemicals in their food. I don't want any chemicals in my food. In my apple, I don't want any chemicals. Well, and to, and to add on to that, it was the way it was introduced. Like it came out of nowhere like a UFO and no one had any idea that, that genetically modified had happened for 10,000 yeah. years. And so it, the communication effort that Bear has taken on recently uh, and launching the thing here and talking, I mean, you know, there's gonna have to be an information and to me, information exchange is good place for technology uh, and creating transparency is a good place for technology, but it makes corporations very nervous because they're used to having all the control of their product development, how they phase it out, the, uh, the intellectual property around it, how many partners that they have. And so that's the moment that we're in right now uh, is both are struggling uh, with, I want more from you and I don't know exactly how to be as transparent as you might want me to be. I don't know if that's fair. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's, that's quite fair. Um, Dilip, let's talk a little bit about geographical differences. Um, so your largest tractor manufacturer in the world, uh, plenty of business in, in India and, and the U.S. as well. How, how do you think about some of the differences um, geographically? What are the things that we can learn from, that you can bring from the U.S. to India, from India to, to the U.S.? Um, so I think uh, I, I, I uh, touched upon the geographical difference. I mean, one is the, uh, the, the, the demographics. That's definitely changing, both in the U.S. and in India, in exactly the opposite direction. The other thing that you have is in, Indi in the U.S., you're, you, we, have, uh, we are seeing a more women farmers. This was not something that, you know, we had seen that traditionally, but now we see women farmers. So when we design our tractors, we need to design it in a way it is easier for the women to get into it. I mean, so, you, you know, the, the, the way we design the steps into the tractor, the way we design the, the machines, the interior of the machine, uh, it has to be... Uh, so we, we just need to make it more comfortable for them. So that is in the U.S. It is not so much in India at this time. In India, it is still uh, male-dominated. 
uh, from a farming perspective, the people who really get into the tractor and operate it, I mean, it's still, so, 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 so on one hand, I mean, we do have the gender difference. So w the learnings that we have from the US when it comes to how to design for women, I mean, we're able to, we would be able to take that to India as and when that market develops. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> the fact of the matter is our, our uh, tractors are all designed in India. So, which is what, uh, and when we sell it here, and again, this was something that I had mentioned. Um, people like our tractors because of its simplicity, not because, and, and our market is essentially hobby farmers in the U.S., uh, and they are the sm sm smaller scale, they are the smaller farmers. And so, they, they, they prefer our tractors when it comes to that. I mean, because of its simplicity, because of use. Uh, so we, we would definitely would love to talk about technologies, the highest levels of technology, but we have to be very careful on how we introduce those technologies into our tractors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the other interesting thing I thought you mentioned uh, during the, your, uh, your talk was farmer's income as being, that's the problem that needs to be solved. Mm -hmm. uh, we heard other <coughs> people mention, you know, everything's optimized for yield that there are a myriad of challenges. Um, the potential solution is around maximizing um, use of resources. What, you know, how do we prioritize all these uh, problems? What are the most important ones? Who wants to go first? Well, again, I think yeah. it, it, again, it's, it's, it's income. I mean, it's, it's what somebody can do with, uh, and how can they, the, he or she produce a crop or, a, or protein, calories, energy, however you want to think about it. Uh, how, how can that grower produce that in a sustainable manner? And sustainable, sure, with respect to the environment, but be able to sustain their livelihood. So all, that's what all this stuff goes into. I mean, all this stuff goes down into, into that, into why uh, the incentive is to be able to sell something. Isn't that a little bit of the outcome of everything else you're, you're doing, though? Yeah. Right, so what are the things that you need to be doing? You know, so is it about better fertilizers, better, um, uh, you know, better tractors, better data, everything? It's, it's a combination of those types of things. It's, every, it's all these types of things that can go into, again, to produce a crop. And whether it's, a, whether it's somebody who's, who's growing, you know, a couple thousand acres of corn in Iowa or has a, 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 a small farm uh, someplace in, in Africa or in India, uh, that's what these that's what these guys that's what they need and that's a, that's one of the things where I also think we need to focus is on smallholders to be able to get the appropriate technology to smallholders so that they can increase their livelihood what about the rest of the sort of value chain so a third of food is lost and we heard that earlier today right so what if we just improve logistics is that a solution would you say it is definitely a solution in the in the supply chain, definitely. But does it really impact the farmer's income? We're not sure about that. Mm. I think what is important is so 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 in the U.S. many of the farms have started branding themselves, and 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 selling themselves as a separate brand, organic. Uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but the first as 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 a, as a territorial entity the first place in the world which has banned every type of farming other than organic farming, so it's 100% organic farming, is a state called Sikkim, which is uh, in India. So it is 100% organic farming. <clears throat> now, government of India is looking at that as a model and saying, how can we spread that across? Now, Whole Foods really kind of took on this whole thing of you know, organic farming. Uh, so, so organic food and organic products. So maybe I think the way the farmers need to think about their income uh, is, is in terms of not just about producing high yields, you know, it, but it is about also marketing it. It is about supply chain. So it's a, there's a number of different things. And it is about land utilization. It's maybe mm -hmm. there's different ways to utilize the land instead of just making a single grain or a single crop. So I'll left field it. Um, so I looked, you know, that slide that I had, that's a cacophony of things wrong with food. Uh, and then everybody has their pet. Uh, and then they start a company or whatever. They optimize for their pet project. And that's fine. 
But if you look at what's common, it's a lack of information. It's a lack of open information exchange. If there was open information that said the product that you just <coughs> only made that farmer half a cent, what do you think the consumer would do about that? So when I go speak to like the cacao industry, which I recently did in Davos, like they show this chocolate bar, and then they show like the percentage of the chocolate bar the chocolate farmer gets, and it's like the one square on the side, and then the other uh, goes to everybody else, and they're like, we want to get the chocolate farmer more money. And everybody says, small shareholder farmer should have more money. But at the end of the day, that means they make less. Uh, and so you, you got to convince somebody to make less uh, in this equation. Um, and you know, even now with everything going on in Turkey and their inability to fertilize the hazelnuts because they don't have the money because the lira just dropped 40 percent, you still don't have companies that can, they want to, that they can't step in and say, you know what, we're going to pay you more for your product this year so that you have the money next year to fertilize your field so that we can guarantee our, our supply chain. So when you have those dynamics, I can't I can't see another way other than extreme transparency. The consumer wants to know it. This information is <coughs> disaggregated. Uh, you know, Mahinda tractors create a lot of information on their own. And it's funny when people talk about self-driving tractors and coming from a farm family, we've had a self-driving tractor <laughs> since I was a little kid that is called a combine that goes through the field that you don't touch and it calculates yield and it goes in a pattern set by GIS coordinates. Like, farming is way ahead uh, of where people think it is. But the data from a Mahindra tractor, tractor, plus the, which would be yield and soil tillage and things like that, plus the sales data for what the farmer got for that product, plus the middleman data for what they took as a percentage, plus the distributor, plus the cold store, plus the second distributor, plus the point of sale. We don't have that uh, information. And it's been purposely disaggregated. And so, but now the thing that could force it, and not for bad intentions, I'm the least conspiracy theorist on earth. But it's just been because that's markets. And now that the, consum the consumer is demanding it, that's going to be the big change. And then we'll see, is food waste the thing that we should focus more on? How many people are focusing on that? Is it, is it nu nutrition fall off in supply chain? How many people are focusing on that? Uh, is it the farmer's wage? Or is it you know what, what we pay for our food? And, and how will we make this balance economically? But maybe in, so, in addition to that, I, I think there's the societal a question around who should get how much of the chocolate I buy, right? Now, there's also the other aspect that you mentioned about the hazelnut in Turkey. There's very little, there, the margins are fairly small in the industry, and that makes it much more pragmatic than others. So if it's a startup or a large company, if you don't provide a real solution, a, a product that really improves the situation for the person who's supposed to buy it, they're not going to do it. It's less wiggle room than people might have with consumers who might pay an extra $100 for the phone, uh, you don't have that in agriculture. And I think that's, that makes it more exciting, because you're really you're, you're forced to providing real solutions. Yeah, but you do have it in organic, right? And so that's the premium, which was mentioned earlier. They're finding the premium to improve the practice. Well, improve is still open question. But like the, you know, whether organic is better, worse, or otherwise, and I have pretty you know, good opinions about that. Um, it doesn't matter. That's a premium that's been labeled as a lifestyle choice. People are saying organic means better for the environment or better for me. I think that's going to be highly scrutinized in the next five years, and I think organic will get thrown under the bus uh, as science picks up the term organic and it's no longer marketing. But that's, that's the reason they're paying. So if you had more information, like you're saying, to justify a price difference, I think you'd get the price difference. Yeah. So I would ec echo that and because, like again, going back to the example of Sikkim, what is effectively happening is people across India, like whether you're in Delhi or Mumbai or Chennai or Bangalore, the moment you see that the product is from Sikkim, you kind of, you pretty much take, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's guaranteed that it's going to be organic. So they're willing to pay a premium for that. So, and that is one. The second part is, as far as Caleb's point about information is concerned, it is critical because, again, in India, what we see is, uh, when we when when we see a farmers use my agriguru and through that we are also able to get the data they are, the farmers have more information in their hands which means they can be exploited less so that exploitation that le uh, the, the, the the lack of that exploitation kind of puts more money in their pocket so this is what kind of adds to the farm prosperity which is kind of what we are trying to drive at and one of what Rabobank does, of course, as a cooperative is help organize smallholders into cooperatives in, in Africa and, and South America and Asia. And again, with this same idea that um, if they can be 
sort of essentially organized and better equipped and supported, and then you know, given sort of the subsidized credit and all of that, then they become sort of a real player together in the supply chain and can enter the supply chain sort of in an organized fashion um, with more stability, you know, for some of the larger players. Yeah. And if I could, Mark, so I want to address something that Caleb just brought up because it's one of my dreams, or one of the, the things I would like to see at some point is, uh, well, first of all, uh, it's what's in a label. See, people see non-GMO verified or they see organic and they associate something with that. I'd like to be able to, at some point, get to a label that something like science inside. And once they know that, they know it's been produced in a sustainable manner with the best technology, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a certain level of trust that would have to come with it. People trust non-GMO verified. They trust that that has some kind of quality to it. They trust organic. That means that's better for me. Which again, when are we going to get there? When are we going to get to uh, an index of nutritional value and yeah. taste value? When it's created by an independent third party yeah. that, exactly. that has trust. Yeah. Five uh, years, ten years, <laughs> twenty years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Audience yeah. questions. Question about uh, farm consolidation. To what extent? Uh, is that inevitable, um, I guess, or around the world? And what would that mean for the pace of adoption of technology and farmer profitability? I don't know if I can really speak to farm consolidation. So does anyone else in the panel uh, have a view of that? Yeah, I think I can, I can share that. Because uh, again, we, we were talking about the demographics. So here in the US, farm consolidation is pretty much a given. Uh, it is going to happen just because of the fact that there are going to be less and less farmers. It is going to be a small, uh, I would say, a medium-scale industry here in the U.S. Uh, so it is definitely going to happen. It's already happening, and it is going to be more. Uh, in India or in the developing countries, subsistence farming is still going on. But at some point, uh, the subsistence farming is not going to be, again, you know, we talk about the farmer's wealth. We talk about farmer's income. Uh, uh, subsistence farming is definitely will not support that. So again, there are going to be cooperatives that is going to kind of lead to um, some sort of uh, uh, consolidate, farm consolidation. Again, we have seen that in the northern part of India in some states, uh, but we are yet to see that in the rest of the country, at least in, in, in India. So I don't know if consolidation is a good or bad thing, but it's driven by yield at all costs. Uh, yield at all costs means bigger, cheaper. Uh, so you have to be bigger than everybody else, and you have to be able to sell your thing cheaper because they only care about the, the size, the, the biomass of the thing that you can produce per market value. If we start switching into things that have more enhanced attributes, then you get a different scale. You get how much nutrition inside, how much flavor inside, which is your differentiator, which could give a smaller grower a better chance. The other thing I've seen, which is kind of interesting, in, in the U.S. lately, and then actually in a project with the with the Kofi Annan Foundation, was about sharing tools among small farmers. So, like the Uber tractor. Uh, so, as the sharing economy grows scale, it used to be you had to grow more to make more money to afford the tool, to grow more to make more money to afford the tool. But now, perhaps there's other methods of supporting mid-sized farmers. And you know, it's not dead in the United States. Ninety percent of Kansan farmers, where we have our farm, are, are, home, are own the farm. Uh, they're not corporate farms. Uh, so, like, I think these technology advances that allow people to utilize infrastructure that's maybe only utilized a day or two a year, or a day every six months, um, would be really helpful. You see models like that in California, actually, uh, because of different harvest cycles for different crops and, and sharing of that equipment. Cold storage sharage and all the other stuff. Yeah. I think partially you answered my question, but I'll ask anyway. The you know we focus a lot on the yields, and you know, uh, but you know there's so many instances when there's a bumper crop, the prices fall, and those there's no buyer to buy, and it's it's a, it's a common cycle. And I don't know uh, what is the answer for that type of a, you know. Uh, situation. It's, it's uh, by storage. It's all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Be the exactly. person with the biggest pins. Uh, Cambridge in crops is another like in company. India, I mean, everybody yeah. can speak. The huge shortage of uh, storage. Um, so it's, it's uh, I don't know. <laughs> can we uh, can we put the upcoming uh, so the events slide up? So we're going to wrap up here. Um, and uh, just want to mention a couple of things. We have some upcoming events that's going to come up there. Uh, we have still some general networking going on for the next half hour or so. Um, 
So thanks again for coming. Uh, you know, please join me in thanking the panelists. Thank you. I felt so weird that you were